Good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley back again for yet another Saturday Research Review. Thank you all for tuning into this one. We've got four articles to review this morning very quickly. And in addition, keep in mind that I always post all of the other research I found for the week in the description that goes with this video, along with links to the four studies I hope to talk about. So uh, first of all, we're going to start out with a dad joke. What do you call a cat with eight legs? Think about it now. You'll get this, and I'm sure. An octopus. Get it? Took me a while. Okay, let's take a look at our research this morning. Uh, first up is an article from the University of Maryland by my good friend Andrea Cronus Toscano and her colleagues. And this one is on the relationship between alcohol use in students with and without ADHD in college and the consequences that may have for their sleep and for downstream consequences often related to excess alcohol use and to cannabis use as well. So we're going to look at ADHD, yes or no, drinking, yes or no, and then the effects of that on sleep, alcohol, and cannabis use. And what they found in this study of college students is that ADHD, when it involved heavy drinking, was significantly associated with greater sleep disturbances than in people with ADHD alone, or even than in typical college students who engaged in heavy drinking. So it looks like there's a differential effect of heavy drinking on sleep in people with ADHD. They also found that the downstream consequences of drinking and cannabis use were not so much related to the extent to which the sleep was being disrupted by the drinking, but to the ADHD itself. So uh, it looks like ADHD, when it involves heavy drinking, has a significant adverse effect on sleep even more so than in other non-ADHD students. However, the consequences from drinking and the consequences from heavy cannabis use were related to ADHD only, and of course, the use of these substances. Sleep did not pay, play a part in those relationships. So a very nice study. Now, let's take a look at a new study, this one out of China. This is gonna look at the shared genetics between ADHD and risk-taking behavior. There have been different studies looking at the genetics of these two, but not many looked at to what extent are the genes for ADHD actually related to, or maybe identical to, the genes that have been found for increased risk-taking behavior. So there's a very large study involving scans of the entire human genome, looking at genes related to these traits, and then to the extent those genes are in fact associated with each other, or maybe even identical. And here are the highlights from this large study. They found yet again, as many other studies have, that ADHD has a very positive and significant relationship to risk-taking. So people with ADHD engage in more risk-taking. They also found that there was a positive correlation between the genetics associated with ADHD and those associated with risk-taking behavior. Indeed, they found several gene sites that were shared between the two. And their point is that there appears to be a causal connection between ADHD and later risk-taking behavior in individuals. And that may be mediated by these shared genes. So uh, a very interesting study there involving a very large sample of individuals looking at shared genetics. Next up is going to be a study, this one out of Japan, uh, and this is on the gut microbiome of children with autism spectrum disorder, children with ADHD, and comparing them to their neurotypical siblings and to non-genetically related neurotypical volunteers. Now, you know we've heard a lot lately in the media about how Autism spectrum disorder may be linked to a different sort of microbiome, a more adverse microbiome in the human gut. In individuals with ADHD, there is some research suggesting that 
this kind of disturbed microbiome does have influences on hormones and other chemicals that might have effects on brain functioning, maybe even brain development. Some people have wondered whether this also extends to ADHD or not. So this study uh, involved 98 subjects divided into those four groups. So the sample sizes aren't real big here, uh, but it's an interesting study because I haven't seen one yet comparing these two disorders on their gut microbiome. The end result of the analyses and the study is that they found that only those individuals with autism spectrum disorder appeared to have disrupted or diverse microbiome relative to the other groups. Uh, and they had two measures of microbiome diversity. One is called alpha diversity. It was lower in those with ASD. And then there's another index called the Shannon index. And on that index, they didn't find any differences at all. So it does appear that there's somewhat of a relationship between lower diversity of gut microbiome in autism spectrum disorder, but not in ADHD relative to these two control groups. So uh, just a, a sort of a, a warning there about future research looking at this. So far, we haven't seen much evidence that the microbiome is involved in ADHD in the gut uh, of these individuals. Okay, so last study we're gonna take a look at is a meta-analysis uh, that was published out of the UK, uh, as well as uh, colleagues from Belgium. And this is a meta-analysis of the prevalence of ADHD in adult prisoners. Now, I've seen dissertations, I've seen a few studies that had these figures as high as 25% of adults in the criminal justice system in prison had adult ADHD. This study points out that uh, they found 11 studies that they could include in the meta-analysis that involved nearly 4,000 individuals in prison. The prevalence they found of ADHD uh, in men and women, uh, but it was not different, excuse me, uh, and what they found is that in the adults with ADHD, the pooled prevalence was about 8%. That's nearly double the prevalence that we see in the general population, which is about 4 to 5%, but it is well below a few of the studies that were in the literature claiming about 25%. And they talk about some of these studies that were outliers, but when you combine all the evidence together in a meta-analysis, and this is the beauty of meta-analysis, is they found that conservatively, it's about 8%, or what would that be, say one in uh, 16 individuals in prison does have adult ADHD. Still a high prevalence, but not as high as people thought. So, all right, so there's your research review for this week. I hope you enjoyed hearing about these four studies. Check out the description for the other studies that were published. And once again, thank you all for joining me for these research reviews. I know they're not the most popular videos on my channel. I can understand that. But on the other hand, there is a subset of my subscribers who do like to keep up with what is happening in recent research in this field. So uh, to you, this one's for you as well. So thanks everybody for joining me. I'll see you again next week for another research review. Watch for other commentaries during the week that I'll be posting as well. And see you again next week. Be well, everybody.